In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse. He separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place. The dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land. The gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation. Seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over all the earth. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that bears fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the air, to every creature that moves along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I, I give every green plant for food. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their vast array. On the seventh day he rested from his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprung up. The Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. There was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the ground and watered the whole surface of the earth. And the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had formed a garden, in the east, in Eden. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the garden, and from there it divided into four rivers. The name of the first river was the Pishon, the name of the second the Gion, the name of the third river, the Tigris, and the name of the fourth river, the Euphrates. Now, the Lord God took the man he had formed, he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, birds of the air, and beasts of the field. But for Adam, No suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. Then he closed the place up with flesh. Then he made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, <laughs> This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called 
woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The man and his wife, they were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We're free to eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some And she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. They made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The woman. <laughs> you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The serpent, he deceived me, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and her offspring and yours. He will crush your head. And you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. 
It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. So the Lord God banished the man from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of Eden cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam lay with his wife Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, Oh, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks. Cain, he worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord, he looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, the Lord did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out in the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood. It cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse, driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Whenever you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you, and you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment! It's more than I can bear. Now you're driving me from the land. I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. If anyone finds me, he will kill me. But the Lord said to Cain, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. And the Lord, he, he put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain, he went out from the Lord's presence. He went to live in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city. He named it after his son Enoch. Adam lay with his wife again. And she conceived and gave birth to Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years. He had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years. Then he died. 
Seth became the father of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. Seth lived 912 years, and then he died. Enosh became the father of Canaan and had other sons and daughters. Enosh lived 905 years, then he died. Kenan became the father of Mahalalel and had other sons and daughters. Kenan lived 910 years, then he died. Mahalalel became the father of Jared and had other sons and daughters. Mahalalel lived 895 years, then he died. Jared became the father of Enoch and he had other sons and daughters. Jared lived 962 years. Then he died. <laughs> Enoch became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God 365 years. Then he was no more because God took him away. Methuselah became the father of of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. Methuselah lived 969 years, then he died. Lamech had a son named him, Noah. After Noah was born, Lamech had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now as men began to increase in numbers on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. They married any of them they chose. And the Lord God said, my spirit, it will not contend with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be a hundred twenty years. The Lord God saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and how every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth. His heart was filled with pain. And the Lord God said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I've made them. But Noah, he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now the earth, it was corrupt in God's sight. It was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become because all the people on earth, they had corrupted their ways. And God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth it is filled with violence because of them. I will surely destroy both them and the earth. Now, make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms for it, coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it, finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door on the side of the ark, make lower, middle, upper decks. I am going to send floodwaters on the earth to destroy all the life under the heavens. Every creature that has a breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that very day, the springs of the great deep burst forth, the floodgates of the heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and for 40 nights. On that 
very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and his son's wives, entered the ark. Pairs of all creatures that had the breath of life in them came to Noah, entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing. Then the Lord shut them in. For forty days the floods had kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose greatly on the earth, and the ark, it floated on the surface of the waters. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains and the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than twenty feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, creatures that swarmed over the earth and all mankind everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air Only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. The waters, they flooded the earth for a hundred fifty days. Then God remembered Noah and the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the great deep, the floodgates of the heavens had been closed. The rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water, it receded steadily from the earth. And on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the tenth month. And on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then Noah opened the window he had made in the ark, and he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the ground. But the dove, it could find no place to set its feet, because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent the dove out from the ark. In the evening, when the dove returned to him, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time the dove did not return to him. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark. So Noah came out, together with his sons, his wife and his son's wives with him and all the animals that came out one kind after another Noah he built an altar to the Lord and he worshipped and the Lord was pleased and said in his heart never again will I curse the ground because of man even though every thought of his heart is evil from childhood Never again will I destroy all living things as I have done. So long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And God said to Noah, I have set my rainbow in the cloud. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. And remember the everlasting covenant between God and all creatures of every kind on the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. From them came the peoples who were scattered over the face of the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, he proceeded to plant a vineyard. 
when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. He lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness. <laughs> he told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth, they took a garment they laid it across their shoulders. They walked in backwards and they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and he found out what his youngest son had done, he said, Cursed be Canaan. Lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be slave to Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years. Then he died. Now, this is the account of Ham and Japheth. From the sons of Japheth came the maritime peoples, those who scattered to the north and to the west. The sons of Ham were Cush, the father of Nimrod, whose kingdoms were Babylon and Assyria, where he built Nineveh. The second son was Misraim, also called uh, Egypt, from whom the Philistines came. And the third son was Canaan, the father of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and Canaanites. And the Canaanite clans, they scattered from Sidon to Gaza and towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain near Babylon, and they settled there. They said, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They use bricks instead of stone, tar instead of mortar. Then they said, come, Let's make ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord, uh, he went down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called uh, Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. The Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. Now, this is the account of Shem. Two years after the flood, Shem uh, became the father of Arphaxad. He had other sons and daughters. Shem lived 500 years and he died. Arphaxad became the father of Shelah and he had other sons and daughters. Arphaxad lived 403 years and then he died. Shelah became the father of Eber and had other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 403 years and then he died. Eber became the father of Peleg and had other sons and daughters. Eber lived 430 years and then he died. Peleg became the father of Ru and had other sons and daughters. Peleg lived 209 years, and then he died. Ru became the father of Sarag and had other sons and daughters. Ru lived 207 years, and then he died. Sarag became the father of Nahor and had other sons and daughters. Sarag lived 200 years, and then he died. Nahor became the father of Terah and had other sons and daughters. Nahor lived 119 years, and then he died. Terah. 
had a son named him Abraham. Now Terah took his son Abraham, his grandson Lot, Abram's nephew, his daughter-in-law Sarah, Abram's wife, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they arrived at Haran, they settled there. Terah died in Haran. Now, the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. If anyone curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now the Canaanites were in the land, but the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. Sir Abram built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As they were about to enter Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, um, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me and let you live. <laughs> Say you are my sister, so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. When they came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman, and they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants, maid servants, and camels. But the Lord, he inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. Why didn't you tell me she's your wife? Why did you say to me, she is my sister? So I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her, go. <laughs> and he gave orders to his men about Abram, sent him on his way with his wife Sarai and everything he owned. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, and Abram had become very wealthy in livestock, silver, and gold. Now, Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land, it could not support them, while well, they stayed together because their possessions were so great. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between me and you, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before us? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up, and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord. So he set out toward the east. They parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom, they were wicked, sinning greatly against the Lord. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Abram answered, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? You have given me no children so that a a servant in my household will be my heir. 
Then the word of the Lord came to Abram again in a vision. This man, he will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him by the hand. He led him outside and said, Look at the heavens, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And they will come out with great possessions and come back here in the fourth generation. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. On that very day, the Lord, he made a covenant with Abram. To your descendants I give this land. From the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Cadmonites, Kenazites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Now, uh, Sarai, uh, Abram's wife, she had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, The Lord, he has, he has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for ten years, Sarai gave Hagar to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my maidservant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. <laughs> your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. So Sarai mistreated Hagar, and Hagar fled from her. An angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert and said to her, Hagar... Servant of Sarai, where'd you come from? Where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel told her, go back to your mistress, submit to her, for I will so increase your descendants, they will be too numerous to count. You are now with child. You will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord, he has heard of your misery. <sighs> he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she bore him. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, as for me, 
This is my covenant with you. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. As for you, you must keep my covenant you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Every male who is eight days old, whether born in your household or bought with your money, those not your offspring, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. As for Sarai, your wife, You are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. For I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. She will be the mother of nations. And kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed as he thought to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah give birth to a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Yes. But Sarah will have a son, and you will call him Isaac. As for Ishmael, I have heard you, I will surely bless him and make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. After he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael, and all those born in his household, or bought with his money, every male in his household, and he circumcised them just as God commanded. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael was 13. The Lord appeared again, this time near the great trees of Mamre, where Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up. He saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried to meet them, and he bowed down to the ground. Oh, oh my lords, if I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought so that you can wash your feet and, and, and rest uh, under this tree. Oh, let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then, then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah. Quick, bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd. He selected a choice tender calf. He gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and some milk and the calf that had been prepared, and he set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under the tree. They asked him, Where is your wife? 
Sarah. Oh, uh, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said to him, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah, she was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind them. She laughed as she thought to herself, now that my husband is old and I am worn out, will I now have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, Sarah, she was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. The angels, they got up and they looked down toward Sodom. Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. And the Lord said to Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The angels got up and they walked toward Sodom. Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom? Will will you not spare the place for the sake of of the fifty righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to to kill the the righteous and the wicked, treating the the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of, of all the earth do right? The Lord answered Abraham, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham spoke up again. (laughs) Now that I have been so bold (laughs) as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, (laughs) what if the number of righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? (laughs) If I find 45 there, I will not destroy it. What if only 40 can be found there? For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Oh, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? (laughs) If I find 30 there, I will not do it. What if only 20 can be found there? For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? The Lord answered. For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. After he had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. The angels, they arrived at Sodom in the evening. Lot was sitting at the gateway to the city. When he saw them, he hurried to meet them, and he bowed down to the ground. My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and rest and then go on your way early in the morning. No, we will spend the night in the square. But Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him. He prepared a meal, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men, from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, they surrounded the house. They called uh, to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. We want to have sex with them. Lot, he went out to meet them. He shut the door behind them. No, my friends, 
don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters. They have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out. You can do whatever you like with them, but please don't do anything to these men. They've come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way! Ha! This man came here as an alien. Now he wants to play the judge. treat you worse than them. Then they moved forward to break down the door, but the angels pulled Lot in. They shut the door behind them, then they struck the men with blindness so that they could not find the door. They said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, anywhere else in the city? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went to speak to the men, pledged to be married to his daughters when he told them what the angels had said. They thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, hurry! When he hesitated, they grasped his hand, the hand of his wife and his two daughters, and led them safely out of the city. Flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere on the plain. By the time they reached Zohar, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the city and the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife, she looked back and she became a pillar of the soul. Early the next morning, Abraham returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe. The Lord was gracious to Sarah. And if for Sarah what he promised, Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When Abraham was a hundred years old, and Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him just as God commanded. Sarah said, Oh, God has brought me laughter, and all who hear of this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew, and on the day he was weaned, Abraham gave a great feast. But Sarah saw Ishmael mocking Isaac. Sarah said to Abraham, Get rid of the slave woman and the slave woman's son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. 
Oh, the matter, it distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son Ishmael. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maid servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maid servant a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water. He gave them to Hagar, placed them on her shoulder, sent her off with the boy to wander in the desert. When the water was gone, Hagar put the boy under one of the bushes, and she sat down nearby, but a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. <laughs> and she began to sob. But the angel of the Lord called to her from heaven and said, What's the matter, Hagar? God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up. Take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. When God opened her eyes, she saw a well of water. Oh, she filled the skin with water and she gave the boy a drink. God was with the boys he grew up. He lived in the desert and he became an archer. His mother, she got a wife for him from Egypt. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Abraham, um, here I am. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey. He took with him two servants and his son, Isaac. When he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, he looked up. He saw the place in the distance. He said to the servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac asked him, Father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. My son. And they went on together. When they came to the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel from heaven called to him, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. For you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram 
and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Sarah died in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife. And he went to speak to the people of the land, the Hittites, and he said to them, I am an alien, a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so that I can bury my dead. The Hittites answered, Abraham, sir, listen to us. You're a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land and said to the Hittites, if you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zoar, on my behalf that he will sell me the cave of Machpelah that belongs to him at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people, and he answered Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had gathered at the gate of his city. Uh, no, my lord, listen to me. I give you the field. I give you the cave that's in it. I give it to you. In the presence of my people, bury your dead. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land and said to Ephron in their hearing, Listen to me, if you will. I will pay the price of the field. Accept it from me so that I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, No, my lord, listen to me. The field, it is worth 400 shekels of silver. What's that between me and you? Bury your dead. Abraham weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of all the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver in the weight current among the merchants. So, Ephron's field and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah in Mamre in the land of Canaan. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. And he said to his chief servant, I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites whose land I'm now living. But go to my own country and my own family and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, well, What if the woman is not willing to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure you do not take him back there. Abraham said, The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel ahead of you to get a wife for my son from there. 
If the woman is not willing to come back with me to this land, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. And he made the servant swear an oath concerning this matter. So the servant got all kinds of good things from his master and he set out for the town of Nahor, Abraham's brother, in Mesopotamia. When he arrived, he had his camels kneel down near the well outside the town where the women go to draw water. Then he prayed, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today. Show kindness to my master. Uh, may it be that when I say to a girl, let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink. And our water, your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She was the granddaughter of Nahor, Abraham's brother. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. The man hurried to meet her. Oh, uh, please, um, give me a little water from your jar. Oh, a drink. My Lord, she said, and she quickly lowered the jar. And I'll water your camels too. <laughs> Without saying a word, the servant watched her closely. When the camels had finished drinking, he took out a gold a nose ring and two gold bracelets, and he asked her, Whose daughter are you? I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor. Then the servant, he bowed down in worship. Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master, Abraham, who led me on the journey to the house of my master's relative. The girl, she ran and told her mother. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban. When he saw the gold nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard Rebecca tell what the man had said, he went out to the man. Come, you are blessed by the Lord. Why are you standing out here? He brought him into the house and food was set before him. But the man said, I, I will not eat until I tell you what I have to say. Then tell us. Laban said, um, I, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord, he's blessed my master abundantly. He's become very wealthy. And my master's wife has borne him a son in his old age, and he's given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath, saying that you must not get a wife of my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I'm now living, but go to my own country and my own clan and get a wife of my son. Then the servant told him everything that happened at the well. When he finished, he said, then I praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. <laughs> Laban and Bethuel said, this is of the Lord. We, we cannot say anything to you one way or the other. Let's ask a girl about it. So they asked her, uh, will you uh, go with this man? I will go. Then the servant, he brought out all kinds of costly gifts for Rebecca and her family. They, they blessed her and sent her on her way with the man. As they approached Canaan, Isaac, he went out to the field to meditate. He looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up, and she saw Isaac. Who, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. Oh, then Rebekah took her veil, and she covered herself. The servant told Isaac all he had done. And Isaac brought Rebekah into the tent of his mother Sarah. He married Rebekah and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. Then he breathed his last and died. An old man full of years and was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron the Hittite. There he was buried with his wife Sarah.
Ishmael went on to live 137 years and died and was gathered to his people. His descendants settled near the borders of Egypt, and there they lived in hostility toward all their brothers. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. He prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because Rebekah was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, became pregnant. The babies, they jostled each other within her and she asked, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment. So he was named Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah, she loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from hunting game. Oh, quick, give me some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob answered, First sell me your birthright. What good is my birthright to me? I'm about to die. <laughs> Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. So Jacob gave him some bread, some lentil stew. He ate and he drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith and Basemath, two Hittite women. Oh, they were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak he could no longer see, he called for Esau's older son and said, I am now old. I don't know the day of my death. Get your quiver and bow. Go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it to me so I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke with Esau. When Esau left, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I overheard your father say to your brother, prepare me the kind of tasty food that I like, so I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully. Do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I may prepare some tasty food for your father just the way your father likes it. Then take it to him to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, but my brother Esau's a hairy man. I'm a man of smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him, bring down a curse upon myself instead of a blessing. My son, let the curse fall on me. Just, just do what I tell you. So Jacob went out and brought the goats to his mother, and she did prepare the tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then she took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, and she put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hand and his neck with the goat skins. She gave him the tasty food. He went to his father and said, uh -uh, Father, yes, who is it? I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. How did you find it so quickly? Ah, the Lord your God, he gave me success. 
come here so I can touch you. Jacob went close to his father who touched him and said, the voice is Jacob's, but the hands, they are Esau's. Are you really my son, Esau? I am, said Jacob. Ah, my son, bring me some of your game to eat. Let me give you my blessing. Jacob brought it and he ate. He brought some wine and he drank. Then Isaac said, come here, my son, kiss me. Jacob went to his father and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son, it is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew of the earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you. May peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. May the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. When Isaac had finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left, Esau came in from hunting game. He too had prepared some tasty food and said, Father, sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Who are you? <laughs> I'm your son, <laughs> your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently. Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me just now? I ate it just before you came in and I blessed him and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out in a loud and bitter cry. Bless me, me too, my father. Your brother, he came deceitfully and he took your blessing. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright. Now he has taken my blessing. Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? I have made him ruler over you and all his relatives. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. What could I possibly do for you, my son? Do you have only one blessing? <laughs> Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept aloud. Isaac answered him, Your dwelling, it will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Esau's anger smoldered against Jacob. The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she called for her younger son, Jacob, and said to him, Your brother, he is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now, my son, listen carefully. Do it, I tell you. Flee at once to my brother Laban. Stay with him until your brother's fury subsides. When he's no longer angry, I will send word for you. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebekah went to Isaac and said to him, I hate living 
because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from Hittite women like these, I will die. I, so Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Hittite woman. <laughs> Go at once to the house of Laban and take a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and, and make you fruitful and may he give you the blessing he gave Abraham so that you may take possession of the land God promised Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way. So Jacob set off for Haran. He stopped for the night at a place called uh, Bethel. He put a stone under his head to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it and there above it stood the Lord and he said I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac I will give you this land that you are lying on and I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth and they will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought to himself, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. Then Jacob, he took the stone he placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking, give me food to eat, clothes to wear, until I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. The stone I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Then Jacob continued on his journey. He came to the land of the eastern peoples. He saw a well in the field with three flocks of sheep lying near it. The stone over the well was large. Jacob said to the shepherds, Friends, um, where are you from? Uh, we're from Haran. Ah, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we do. Is he well? Yes. Here comes his daughter Rachel with his sheep. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over, he moved the stone from the mouth of the well, and he watered Laban's sheep. Then he, he kissed Rachel, and he began to weep. He told Rachel that he was a relative of her father, the son of Rebekah. She ran and told her father. When Laban heard the news about Jacob, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him into his home. And Jacob told him all these things. And Laban said, You are my own flesh and blood. Now, after Jacob had stayed with him a whole month, Laban asked him, just because you are a relative of mine, you work for me for nothing, tell me, what should your wages be? 
Now, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah, she had weak eyes. <laughs> but Rachel, she was lovely in form and beautiful, and Jacob was in love with Rachel. I, I work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, better to give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob worked seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said, give me my wife. My time is completed. I want to lie with her. So Laban called together all the people, and he gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his older daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. He also gave Zilpah to be Leah's maidservant. When morning came, <laughs> it was Leah. Jacob said to Laban, What have you done? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why did you deceive me? Laban replied, It is not our custom here to give away the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish out this daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years' work. <sighs> Jacob did so. He finished out the week with Leah. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. He also gave Bilah to be Rachel's maidservant, and he slept with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. Now, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, saying, It is because the Lord, he has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Leah conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Oh, this time I will praise the Lord. And so she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Now, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. <laughs> Well, Jacob became angry with her and said, am, am I in the place of God? Who has kept you from having children? Then she said, well, here is Billa, my maidservant. Sleep with her so that through her I too can build a family. So she gave him Billa as a wife, and Jacob slept with her. Billa conceived and bore Jacob a son, and Rachel said, God has vindicated me. And because of this, she named him Dan. Billa conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister, and I have won. So she named him Naphtali. Now when Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her maidservant Zilpah and gave it to Jacob as a wife. <laughs> Zilpah conceived and bore Jacob a son, and Leah said, What good fortune! And so she named him Gad. 
Zilpah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, How happy I am. And so she named him Asher. Now, during wheat harvest, Reuben found some mandrake plants, which he gave to his mother, Leah. Rachel said to Leah, Oh, please, uh, give me some of your son's mandrakes. Leah answered, Wasn't it enough you took away my husband? Will you take away my son's mandrakes too? Very well, he can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So when Jacob came in from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him. Oh, you must sleep with me tonight. I, I have hired you uh, with my son's mandrakes. So Jacob slept with her that night. Well, God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son, named him Issachar. She conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son son named him Zebulun. Later she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Then God, he remembered Rachel. He listened to her. He opened her womb. Rachel became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she said, Oh, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph, saying, Oh, may the Lord add to me another son. Now, after Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me on my way with my wives and children so I can go back to my own homeland. Laban replied, Oh, if I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination the Lord. He has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will pay them. Jacob replied, Well, you know how hard I have worked for you and how well your livestock have fared under my care. But when can I do something for my own household? What shall I give you? Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But do this one thing for me, and, and I will go on tending your flocks. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them all the sheep and goats that are spotted and speckled. They will be my wages. And my honesty, it will testify for me, any sheep or goat in my possession that is not spotted or speckled shall be considered stolen. Agreed, Laban said. Let it be as you have said. But that day... Laban took all the male goats that were spotted and speckled. He placed them under the care of his sons, and he put three days' distance between his sons and Jacob. Jacob, however, he took fresh-cut branches from poplar trees. He peeled back the bark to expose the white inner wood. Then he placed all the peeled branches in the watering troughs, so that when the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they mated in front of the branches, and they bore young that were spotted and speckled. Jacob mated the stronger animals near the well, but not the weaker ones. The weaker animals went to Laban, the stronger ones to Jacob. In this way, Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous. Sometime later, Jacob learned that Laban's sons had become jealous and that Laban's attitude toward him, it was not what it had been. Then God said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, and I will be with you. So Jacob called for Rachel and Leah. When they came, he said to them, You know, I have worked for your father with all my strength, and yet your father, he has cheated me. He has changed my wages ten times. Angel of God appeared to me in a dream and said, I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, he said, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Rachel and Leah said to him, Do whatever God has told you. 
Without telling Laban, Jacob took his family and all his possessions and set out for his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. After three days, Laban heard that Jacob had fled. Laban and his sons pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him near the hill country of Gilead. But during the night, God appeared to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. The next day, Laban approached Jacob. What have you done? You have deceived me. You have carried off my daughters like captors of war. Why didn't you tell me? I would have sent you out with joy and singing to the music of tambourines and harps. But you did not even let me kiss my grandchildren goodbye. You have done a foolish thing and I have the power to harm you. But last night the God of your fathers, he appeared to me, told me not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob replied, well, I was afraid because I thought you'd take your daughters away from me by force. What sin have I committed that you hunt me down? I was with you for 20 years. I served you 14 years for your daughters and six years for your flocks and you, you changed my wages 10 times. But, but God, he has seen my hardship and last night he rebuked you. Laban replied, The women are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, everything you see is mine. But what can I do? Come. Let us make a covenant and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob set up a pillar. He poured oil over it. Then Laban made a vow saying, If you mistreat my daughters, if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember God, he is a witness between us. This pillar, it is a witness. I will not harm you and you will not harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of our fathers, judge between us. Jacob took the vow. He offered a sacrifice. Then he invited his relatives for a meal. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters, and he blessed them, and then he returned home. Jacob continued on his way. He sent messengers ahead of him to go to his brother Esau in Edom. When the messengers returned, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob prayed, God, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who, who said to me, go back to your relatives and, and I will make you prosper. I'm not worthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. I had only a staff when I crossed this Jordan River, but, but now I have great abundance. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid that he will attack me and the mothers with their children. But, but you have said, I will surely make you prosper and make your descendants like, like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be counted. Then Jacob selected six herds from his flock, each by themselves. He placed them under the care of his servants. He said to the lead servant, go on ahead of me. 
when my brother Esau meets you and he asks, who owns these animals? You say to him, they are a gift for my Lord Esau from your brother Jacob. And be sure to say, he's coming behind us. He told the other servants to say the same thing. And be sure to say, he's coming behind us. For he thought, I'll pacify him with these gifts. Then when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. That night, Jacob took his two wives, his two maid servants, his eleven sons. He crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak when the man saw that he could not overpower him. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? Jacob, then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man, and you have overcome. Jacob asked him, oh, please tell me your name. Why do you ask my name? And the man blessed Jacob there. Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, It is because I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming with his 400 men. He divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the maid servants. Then he went on ahead and he bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him. He embraced him. He put his arm around his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. Esau looked up and he saw the women and the children. He asked, who are these with you? Oh, these are the children God has graciously given your servant. Uh, what did you mean by all these droves I met? <laughs> to find favor in your eyes, my lord. Ah, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. And now that you have received me favorably, please accept the present that has been given you for God 
He has been gracious to me. And I have all that I need. And then Esau said, Come, my brother, let's be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob replied, Oh, my, my Lord knows the children, they are tender. And I must care for the ewes and the cows that are with their young. So let my Lord go on ahead while I move along more slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children. So that day Esau returned to Edom. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel, build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were running away from your brother, Esau. So Jacob, he called together all the people that were with him, and he said to them, Get rid of all the foreign gods that you have. Purify yourselves then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me on the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they brought Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and, and the rings in their ears, and he buried them. And they set out and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Bethel in the land of Canaan, and there Jacob built an altar because it was there that God revealed himself to him. And God appeared again and said, Your name will be Israel. So God named Jacob Israel. He also said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. Kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him. And so, Jacob went home to the land where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. The land of Canaan. 